Hello, welcome to Beyond the Mask podcast. In this episode, we'll tackle the anxiety that often surrounds election season. As we navigate the political landscape, we'll focus on finding balance amidst the stress and worries that elections can bring. Whether it's the fear of the unknown or concerns about political outcomes, we'll discuss a little bit about them today. And we have a special guest with us today. And his name is... Jeremy. We're Jeremy together. <laughs> That's right, it's Jeremy. It's Jeremy. That's right. That's right. Thanks What's... to Bill Bruce for naming us. <laughs> naming us Jeremy. I love it. <laughs> Beyond the Mask is made possible by CRNA Financial Planning. This episode is also powered by CRNAeducation.com. CRNAs can access over 100 AANA-approved credits, including all four core CPC modules and more than 40 pharmacology credits. It's subscription-free, fully online, and optimized for mobile use. Visit crnaeducation.com for your continuing education needs. Plus, did you know listening to our podcast can earn you Class B credits? For details on how to submit, visit the CE credit section at beyondthemaskpodcast.com. Welcome to Beyond the Mask, innovation and opportunities for CRNAs and advanced practice nurses with certified financial planner Jeremy Stanley and CRNA Sharon Pierce. Jeremy Stanley has worked with CRNAs for more than 23 years, and Sharon Pierce is a former president of the AANA and the NCANA. Join us as we leave the operating room and learn the latest in the CRNA and advanced practice nurse industries. Beyond the Mask starts in 10... Nine, Nine, eight, eight seven. seven. What are we going to talk about today, Jeremy, as we sit here taping on the day of the presidential debate tonight? So we're taping on September the 10th, 2024. Yeah. So, well, we're going to be talking about politics. We're going to be talking a little bit about, you know, the financial landscape and What's happened year to date? You know, obviously there'll be a lot of people watching that debate tonight. By the time this airs, you'll already know what the political pundits have said about uh, that debate. And, you know, possibly one candidate gets a little bump from this debate. We will see. You know, it was the debate between Trump and Biden that, you know, basically took Biden out of the election. So, you know, it, it'll be interesting times. Uh, but today we're going to be going at it from not really the political side of it, but what does politics mean maybe for you financially? You know, Sharon, as you well know, we have friends that listen to us on the left and we have friends that listen to us on the right. And, and friends that listen to us from the middle. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, you know, we're agnostic on this podcast, but I think that people are really worried if whoever they're not voting for wins the election, that the economy and uh, their portfolios are going to tank. Uh, so, you know, maybe we'll talk about a little bit of historical standard there. And, you know, I always try to remove emotion. Sharon, you know, you're pretty emotional and attached to your money, right? Oh, Yes. Are you not attached and emotional about your money, Jeremy? I'm emotional about my money, but I'm not emotional about your money. I don't believe that because you manage my money. I know better than that. I am, but I can make logical, rational decisions. Sure. I do understand. You know how hard you work for your money, and so does everyone else. So, you know, that's that's one of the things. You know, and here we are. We've got fall is here. The kids are back in the classroom, and it really seems like a a good time to kind of reflect on, you know, some of the tests that the U.S. economy has, has had and, and, the, and the stock market. You know, kids are going to be taking tests again. And, you know, we've had a lot of tests this year. And, and really, when the markets are tested, it really helps that foundation of future growth get stronger. When we're going through it, people really don't feel it, you know. Uh, but it's like any kind of test. You always get better on the outside of that test. You learn something. You might have learned something about yourself. And it's the same thing with the economy when it's tested as well. And, you know, let's back up for a minute and talk about, you know, what's happened over, over the last few years. I mean, 
you know, obviously we had this huge amount of inflation in the economy. The Federal Reserve engineered one of the most aggressive rate tightening campaigns in 2022 and 2023 that we've really ever seen. And that was a test for, for our economy. Okay, let's talk about rate tightening. I know that's your verbiage and not everybody may understand that, just like you don't understand our verbiage sometimes. So what is, talk about rate tightening. Well, you know, one of the ways the the Federal Reserve tries to manipulate our economy is through the rates that are paid on interest and interest. And it basically removes liquidity from the system. So if they are, if they're tightening what's called the Fed funds rate, um, in other words, making it higher, then yes, your accounts are going to pay you a little bit more interest, your cash bearing accounts, but it's taking liquidity out of the system, which in turn slows the economy down, which is what they had to do in order to get the inflation rate about down from over 9% to where we are today. As part of that, Sharon, you know, everybody and their brother was calling for a recession. The Fed increased rates by one of the fastest splits ever in the history of the United States. Um, we hadn't seen anything like that, but we also hadn't seen the amount of money that, that they put into the economy during COVID before. Now, and- back up. Now, even during Carter years, because, you know, whenever I went to nursing school during Carter years, rates were 22%. Right, right. So, yeah. and we even beat that? I mean, well, I know we didn't speaking, go up that high, but you're, you're right. talking what, what about sequentially was, going up. Yeah. I mean, they basically increased rates at the fastest clip. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So they went from, you know, rate, rate, rate increase at the fastest clip we, we have really seen in, in a very, very long time. Which it's funny. I've been talking to some of these kids who are talking about buying houses and they're like, Oh my God, it's seven and a half percent. We got some poor ones. I mean, yeah. I mean, that is that uh, seven and a half percent was a good rate. I mean, I borrowed at that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, but even through all this, you know, we haven't had a recession yet is the operative word. The economy chugged right along and consumers continued to spend even as rates continued to rise. So how'd they do it? Well, you know, one of the things that helped was stimulus. That stimulus helped consumer get through a a difficult situation. It was probably more stimulus than we needed. But the other thing that helped is uh, low fixed rate mortgages because rates were lower. Mortgages were basically easier to get on a higher valued property. And people were out buying and spending that money. But the economy past that test. I guess that's what we're saying here as we use the the school analogy. And, you know, as we sit here today, it seems like we've passed the inflation test as well. You know, if you follow the consumer price index, which which peaked at 9.1% increase in prices in June of 2022, last month it dipped below 3%. Now, what should we be? Uh, I mean, is there a should we be number? Well, we're price index and give us some parameters around that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Fed would like to see us around a 2% number. That's kind of where they want to see. That's helpful. So 9% means something to me now when it didn't just uh, two minutes ago, right? (laughs) Right. Right. Yes. And it, it's been a, a, a long, arduous getting back to more of a, a normalized level because inflation is not good for the economy, but deflation prices going down is probably worse. So, um, so it seems like we've kind of passed that test, um, as we kind of look at that, you know, in response to that, you, you know, when you look at the 10 year treasury, which Sharon is a bond treasury bond. Um, the yield is down almost a full percentage point since April of this year. Mortgage rates are down even more. So again, did we pass that? I would say we're kind of incomplete on that. Mm-hmm. Haven't passed yet. But the stock market also passed a test recently. Sharon, what happened in August? Do you remember? Oh, we the the stock market's been doing great. 
Well, you know, on August the 5th, because we had a weaker than expected jobs report and, you know, we also had a little too much borrowing from complacent traders. Much of it was Japanese yen currency, which is called the carry trade. It caused a very sharp sell-off in the markets, but stocks have bounced back on subsequent evidence that the economy continues to grow steadily. Now, we've seen a little bit more in the last week or so uh, with the jobs numbers that come out and people are a little concerned now because the Fed's mandate is controlling inflation, but also controlling jobs and job growth. So now they feel like they're getting there on inflation, but what we've seen is job growth has now been cut down. They had to slow the economy down. Jobs are slowing now. If it slows too much, too rapidly, we could enter a recession because of that. So now that dual mandate comes into focus, which means mm. the is probably going to lower rates September of this year. They're probably going to continue throughout the rest of the year and into next year. So, you know, again, these, these are all things that are tests, but I think some of the toughest tests may lie ahead. Um, as we alluded to a little earlier, Sharon, you know, we do have an election with a little bit of what we're going to call policy uncertainty, and that could be the catalyst for a correction. You know, a correction is defined as a 10% down move in the market. Uh, Sounds painful. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. But isn't it usually more volatile around election season? That's what I've always understood. Yeah, you, you will see a little more volatility, especially in an election like this, you know, where it's so tight between the candidates and they there is a definite defining mechanism between the two. I mean, they're, they're completely two different ends of the policy spectrum. Are you in search of a straightforward, dependable solution for your continuing education requirements as a CRNA? Well, discover CRNAeducation.com where we make your professional development our priority. We are an NBCRNA recognized provider, fully equipped with all four core CPC modules required for your certification. Select from courses offering one, two, or three credits, perfectly fitting into your busy schedule. All courses are available online and designed to be mobile friendly, ensuring you can advance your knowledge anytime, anywhere. Visit CRNAeducation.com today and learn more about how we can be your partner in continuing education. You know, we do have a lot of geopolitical things going on too. I mean, you got China out there, you got Russia, Iran, all those things that are going on. And eventually if this U.S. debt pile that continues to grow, continues at the pace we are, we're going to see bond vigilantes. They're going to demand higher treasury yield. They're going to want more return for taking on our debt, which is a problem. So mm, I didn't think about that. Yeah, I mean, and and valuations in the markets are still a little high, even considering the double-digit earning growth that we're seeing from corporate America. So corporate America seems to be in pretty good shape right now, but these are tough tests that, you know, we could expect maybe some more volatility and maybe even a little pullback from here. But, But I will say, expect this bull market to continue, and over time, Bring home some excellent report cards, share. Mm, I like good report cards. <laughs> well, let's go back to the election because, you know, that just seems to be what everyone is focused on. I mean, that was a great little economics lesson and a little bit about the markets. But right now, people are concerned. Um, everyone is emotional about this election. And one thing we know is when you add emotions into markets and decisions, it increases volatility. And that's some of what we've seen and we'll continue to see. It's interesting to me because I remember when Trump got elected, Mm -hmm. our friends on the left thought he's going to destroy the country. He is going to destroy the economy. And this is just the end of the world. Well, by all intents and purposes, it didn't. And now I remember when Biden got elected. And our friends on the right said, he's going to destroy the country. He's going to destroy the economy. And guess what, Cher? It didn't. 
And, you know, I think that markets are really somewhat agnostic when it comes to who wins election, uh, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, you know, the market really will see its way through it. I mean, it, it's done that in the past. I mean, if you go back and you look through markets and through history, basically the market has seen us through every single election and has still over the long term continued to slope to the right, meaning grow. Mm -hmm. So in fact, share what's interesting is if you go back to 1949, all right, and you, you, you looked at the S&P 500 index. During that time period, if you stayed fully invested, in other words, you didn't worry about the market, you just left your money in there, you put $10,000 back in in 1949, you would have over three and a half million dollars right now. Okay. If you said, hey, I'm only going to invest because let, let's say you're a Democrat. You know, I'm only going to invest when Democrats are in office. Do you know that you would have less than $500,000? Okay. Do you have the opposite of that? If you would have invested when the Republicans were only Republicans in office? You have even less. Oh, my. So there you go. I mean, that is a telling sign that paying attention to elections and the emotional side of it, it's probably a bad idea. You know, if you look at the average annual return, okay, the average annual return back from 1949 the 2023 share. If you looked at a Democratic president, okay, and you had the makeup of Congress of being fully Democratic, okay, mm -hmm. at all, you know, all of Congress and the presidency, your return for that time period is 13.9%. Everything Democratic. Everything Democratic. Okay. And which doesn't really happen that often. It, it doesn't, but. But I, th I think people crave the middle. That's why they'll have one party in the White House and Congress is another party because people are trying to drive it to the middle. That's that's a Sharon Pierce philosophy, by the way. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Now, on the flip side, if you've got a Republican president during that time period with a Republican Congress, Sharon, your return is 10.7 percent. Mm hmm. All right. Why Why do you think that is? Because most people believe that Republicans as conservatives do better with money. Yeah. I, I mean, why that is, I really don't know. I mean, we're talking about from 1949 to now. I mean. That's interesting. A little interesting tidbit, though. It's really interesting. Now, here's some more interesting. Now, let's say you've got a Democratic president and a Republican makeup of Congress. Guess what your returns are now? I have no idea. This is flummoxing me on so many uh, uh, ways anyway. 18.5%. <laughs> okay. Republican White House, Democratic Congress. Is that what you said? No, Just Dem Democratic, Democratic White, White House, Republican, Republican Congress, which is? 18.5%. Kind of what we got now. Yep. Now, the vice versa to that is if you've got a Republican cre uh, president. Mm-hmm. Democratic Congress, your returns are 7.5%. Now, to, to kind of bring this together, you've got to do Yeah, I need some help it. here because my brain is going <laughs> in a million <laughs> different directions. Well, it, it's interesting, you know. Um, you've got a Democratic president and Congress is split. Okay? Split. 18.1%. You've got a Republican president. And Congress is split 17.6%. What does that tell us? We need to have a split Congress. The market seems to like it split if you look at the returns. And more than likely in this election, you know, it's a tight election, but it looks like some form or fashion we're going to be split. So, those are just interesting tidbits as we look at, you know, trying not to be emotional hmm. in, in our decision making. Um, you know, if you look at the average return of the S&P going all the way back from 1928 to 2020, okay, if a Republican won the election, okay, 
for the election years, the rate of return for that year was 15.3%. 15.3%. Okay. All right. Democrat was elected. The Are we talking president? Yes. President. Okay. 8.5%. In all election years, it's averaged 11.58%. Interesting tidbits here. You know, I think the moral of this story is, again, we all get emotional about certain issues. Certain issues are what wins elections. It's probably five to seven issues on each side that divides our country and divides Republicans and Democrats. Those five to seven issues typically are not issues with corporate America. There are other issues. I think if we're looking at this, yes, I think there probably is going to be some increased volatility because of emotions. But I also think that if you look past that, we're probably going to be okay either way. The, the moral of the story here is, um, yes. You're going to have emotions around those five to seven issues that are important to you, but it doesn't mean that the world is coming to an end. And it doesn't mean that just because someone gets elected president, that our economy is going to crash. Now, not saying it's not going to, but it doesn't necessarily mean that just by who gets elected president. Are you a resident or CRNA looking to transition into independent practice? Introducing the 1099 CRNA Institute, taught by Beyond the Mass Coast, Jeremy Stanley and Sharon Pierce. This comprehensive educational series provides detailed guidance on business structure, legal and tax implications, and financial management, tailored specifically for 1099 CRNAs. Enroll now and earn valuable continuing education credits as you chart a new course in your rewarding career. Plus, enjoy a special 20% off discount through November by using the discount code BEYOND1099. Remember, that's aana.com 1099 or click the link in the description of today's show. The 1099 CRNA Institute. Thrive as your own boss. Well, from the tidbits that you've offered, it sounds like it's uh, more important who's elected to Congress, not who's elected as the figurehead that sits in the White House. There you go. And I, and I told someone that today, I was talking to them about that. You know, she's worried that, uh, she's, she's on the list and she's worried if Trump gets in there, he's going to, uh, destroy social security and she's retired. And, you know, she felt like that he would just mandate a change to social security. And I said, well, Congress has got to do that. Mm -hmm. President can't just unilaterally make those changes. It's got to go through Congress. And so it's truly an act of Congress, truly an act of Congress. Right. You know, with all this being said, I, I think the moral of the story here is, you know, have more of a long-term perspective, make sure that you're in a certain type of portfolio that matches your risk tolerance, make sure that you understand what your end goal, your end objective is, set your financial goals and try to not watch the news and get so emotional around this election that happens every four years. If the average lifespan is, you know, let's call it 80 years old. We're going to live through about 20 elections in our life, Sharon. And of that, you're probably not going to remember four of them because four of you'd have been 16 to 18 and you really didn't give two cents about elections. Mm -hmm. So really 15, 16 elections in your life now. So all that though, Sharon, I got nothing else to say. Uh, sounds like you have given us plenty of food for thought and some of it uh i find a little bit surprising and you know I, I i think it goes back to exactly what you said it goes back to emotion and a lot of times we can't even quantify why we have that emotion well you're exactly right i mean you know feelings are fleeting and i you know i try to always well i hope not don't tell mike pierce that yeah. My anniversary was last week, 41 years of marriage. So we're not going to go with that one. 
Well, and, and emotions are fleeting, you know. I mean, at, at a minute you love him, and in a minute you hate him. I mean, you know, well, that part is true. Sometimes. Right. <laughs> so, and that's what I say. I mean, these these are fleeting, and you know, we we try not to react based upon emotion because of that. And I think if you can do that, not only are you probably going to be a better investor, you're probably going to be a happier person. Mm, very good points. Well, Sharon, I'm going to say that's a wrap. I think so. Well, we want to especially thank our listeners for listening to Beyond the Mass. We couldn't do this without them, and we really want to thank them. And Sharon, if they like our show and they want to help us, how can they do that? Well, the best way to help us grow is to leave us a review, tell all your friends, share us on social media. You know, we've never advertised this podcast, Jeremy, and we have grown purely by word of mouth. Yes, and and we, again, want to thank you for listening and and sharing. You know, I think that out of this podcast has come a lot of things that we didn't expect, and we've helped a lot of people, um, and it's helped us grow as well. So I think we both appreciate that. Absolutely. Until next time. It's a wrap. 